Uh, for those who are not aware, apparently Ryan Grimm has published a book about the squad. Um, so this is pretty interesting. Case study QB, uh, case study QB uh, captured this. So one of the things that Ryan Grimm uh, exposes in this book is the relationship that AOC and Nancy uh, Pelosi had. So this is really interesting. We're going to get into this clip here from Case Study QB. But one thing I want you to remember when you hear this from Ryan Grimm, and then you're going to hear uh, Jink Uger's response in reference to this. One thing I just want to say is that you have to remember that Ryan Grimm is the DC Buru chief for The Intercept. So in order for him to have that role, he has to play into the hands of the politicians, meaning that he has to make sure that he maintains access. So he's never going to be too critical of these politicians because then he will lose his access. So just keep that in mind when you listen to some of the things that he's saying. Let's go ahead and get into this clip here from Case Study QB, Ryan Grimm here speaking to Mehdi Hassan. Let's go. Before the break, I talked about how we've all come to know the squad as the progressive left wing of the House Democrats. A new book by The Intercept's DC bureau chief, Ryan Grimm, called The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Future, pulls the curtain on their lives on Capitol Hill, including their relationships with certain congressional leaders. Ryan Grimm joins me now. Uh, Ryan, congratulations on the book. Uh, you say in the book, and you talk a great deal in the book, and it's very timely given the war in Gaza, how APAC has targeted members of the squad over their uh, pro-Palestinian views, their anti-Israeli views, as early back as 2021, when they denounced Israel's bombing of Gaza back then. There's now this reported $100 million push to primary them because of their call for a ceasefire. What's their reaction been to this push by APAC? So Justice Democrats uh, has, I think, become reinvigorated. Justice Democrats is the organization that kind of was spawned by the staffers from the first Bernie Sanders campaign. They, they, you know, recruited and supported a lot of the a lot of the squad. They supported all of the squad, recruited some of them, and have continued to you know elect further squad members since. They've been a bit in retreat uh, in in recent years, both in terms of fundraising, staffing, uh, profile. But I think this. You know, there, there's a there's a phrase that kind of, you know nothing focuses the mind like the hangman's noose, and you know the the question has been called by APAC. You know the 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 threat is out there that there's like you said a hundred million dollars is going to be spent to purge the party of of critics of Israel, and so the the only choice is to organize and and fight back. And from my understanding, there is a a broad based uh, effort underway with a broad coalition of progressive groups to figure out how. Uh, they can push back against this this storm of money that they know is coming the next primary cycle. So let me just pause there for a second, because I do want to be clear about something when he brings up Justice Democrats. Justice Democrats also announced that they are not running any new candidates. So like that's it. They don't have any money. Like the, the money is gone. Right. So. That's that. Like, this is why they've, they've kind of been kind of silent lately. Like, they don't have new people to run under Justice Democrats. So what you have right now, that's what you got. That's it. So it's not like before where you'd have another cycle of candidates run through and then another one. No, they announced that they don't have the funding uh, to make that happen. So just just an FYI. And of course, what's fascinating is that despite being incumbents, they can't automatically rely on the support of party leadership, which normally comes in behind incumbents. Mm -hmm. And what you reveal in your book is some of the tensions that we kind of suspected existed between Nancy Pelosi and AOC and Ilhan Omar and others. What's really interesting in the book and some of the extracts that have made it into media reporting as well, Ryan, is that AOC is telling you Actually, it's not just about amorphous establishment leadership. It was specifically about Pelosi, that she actually gets along fine with Hakeem Jeffries. It was Nancy Pelosi that she had issues with. I mean, so, some of this, I think, has to do with the way that Pelosi, you know, when she first came to office in the 1980s and, and when she rose to become leader of the party, was seen as somebody from the progressive flank. And so, you know, as as people get older and see new generations coming behind them, they get they get a little bit uh, concerned when people say, "Wait a minute, you know, I'm the I'm the one who's you know the 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 proud liberal, the lion here, the the progressive champion." I'm sorry. See, I have to push back on that a little bit because 
it's not like there weren't other people that came in after Nancy Pelosi that could have had progressive titles, right? There were people that came in after her, like Dennis Kucinich came in after Nancy Pelosi. Like, granted, wasn't a female. He wasn't a female, obviously. But there were other people that did come in. So I don't think, I, I feel like this is Ryan Grimm trying to, again, protect the squad. Like I said, in order for him to have access to them, this is what he has to do. He can't be too critical of them. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to write that book. We got to call it what it is. This is how these things get to, to happen, right? So I think this is his way of trying to tell people, hey, this is why the squad may have not pushed back or may have not pushed back on dim establishment or fought for some of the things that you wanted them to fight for. In a sense, at the same time, actively protecting the squad from critique. So that's important to know. So now it's, it's let's just put all the blame on Nancy Pelosi. You see how this works? Let's just put all the, the blame on Nancy Pelosi and say, well, it was Nancy Pelosi that caused all the problems, regardless of who was there before or whatever. You had a job. When you signed up and you took that pledge with Justice Democrats, you were supposed to do certain things. And one of those things was to immediately, as soon as you had that narrow, that narrow majority, you were supposed to force that vote for Medicare for all. This is straight from the DSA handbook. It's not like I came up with this, right? And they chose not to do that. So you have to understand, I, I don't need to read this book. I don't even need to read it because all I know is this is just one big book to try to find a way to protect the squad and try to revamp their image because their image isn't good anymore. It's just not. So he's saying that AOC said that she had problems with Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi was the problem, but she doesn't have these issues with Hakeem Jeffries. Let's continue. And she would, she would often tell the squad and, and tell uh, protest groups as well, say, you know, I've got uh, protest signs in my basement uh, that are older than you. Yes. Uh, and whereas a AOC responds, well, okay, but mine aren't mine aren't collecting dust. And that really gets to the, the tension there. And so, uh, but now that Hakeem Jeffries is leader, uh, the party is in the minority. And it's not as if, and, and so it's, I think it's kind of easier to organize your caucus in the minority because you're just fighting against the majority party. You don't have kind of decisions to make over what your agenda is because you're not going to be able to pass an agenda anyway. So there's also more of them, Ryan, right? I mean, there's, there's Summer Lee and there's Cory Bush, in addition to the original quartet. And I wonder, what does the future look like for the squad? Because at one point they were seen as the future of the Democratic Party, dragging it left. You had Bernie Sanders, you know, as runner up to Joe Biden. He's not running for president again. Biden is running again. Uh, you're getting some guests uh, joining the discussion, I can see. Um, so uh, uh, tell me this, Ryan, what is the future of the squad? Are we actually going to see a weakened, smaller squad, a weakened, smaller left come November 2024? Well, right now, Ilhan Omar is on Twitter asking people to donate to her campaign to help her fight off all the money that's coming in from APAC to push her out. APAC is going after every single one of them. Jamal Bowman already has a primary challenger. Jamal Bowman actually was just censured as well. I don't know if you guys knew about that. For pulling that fire alarm, he was just censured as well. Uh, they're already offering money to people to, to run against Rashida Tlaib. So like they're, they're going to target all of them. All of them are going to be targeted. We'll see. I mean, this, this, is a, this is the pivotal moment. This is the time where they will understand. Sydney, come on. Oh my God. It, is, it is past their bedtime, and so it's like 8, you know, 8.30. They're I, supposed to I've be I've always been this paranoid is, yeah, that my yeah. daughter would do that in my home studio. She hasn't, but you have. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Yeah. I'm sure she cares about the future so of the th squad, too. Yeah, this is right. Yes, she very much does. No, this this is the moment. This is this is where the question's being called. And we'll know at the end of the, this primary whether or not they're going to be a big a, 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 big part of this party going forward or not. And last question, Ryan, AOC, what does she do next? You guys see her in the background? <laughs> it's funny. I'm sorry. Okay. They get into the part of what does AOC uh, do next? She's playing in the background. And last question, Ryan, AOC, what does she do next? Does she run for the Senate? 
So I don't I don't think so. So here's here's my here's my point uh, when I when I think about her running for the Senate and I, and I write in the book uh, that that some of her uh, staffers would say, look, when you're thinking about whether or not to endorse Bernie Sanders, uh, you have to realize that Bernie Sanders is actually more popular um, up in upstate New York than you are, according to the polling at this point. So getting behind somebody like Bernie actually moves you forward. And so, you know, the the idea that so I think basically the point here is that she would have, I think, a better chance of winning the White House uh, than she would winning a Senate seat. And so if they're equally difficult. Did you guys just hear that? He said that AOC would have a better chance of winning the White House than she would the Senate seat. I told you there was a reason why she's the one that's always singled out from the squad, because I believe from day one with Justice Democrats, they had already decided that she was going to be the one. She checks off all the boxes. I told you this before. She checks off all the boxes, right? So, so think about it. Think about it this way. She is a woman. She's Latina right? She is bilingual. She went to, I guess I would consider BU still a prestigious school. She went to an expensive Boston college, right? She checks off all the boxes. She's from New York. I told you from day one, they had already decided that she was going to be the one. This is why if you watch that documentary, Knocking Down the House, notice there's more attention focused on her than it was on the other candidates. Corey Bush is in knocking down the house. So is Paul Jean Swearingen. And so was Amy uh, Viela. And all three of them at that point, they lost, right? Corey Bush didn't win the first time, but she did win the second time. But all three of them at that point in time, they, they lost, but they didn't know that obviously they're filming the documentary in real time as they're running their campaigns. But still, most of the documentary, most of the focus was on AOC. That's why I'm trying to tell you guys, they had already decided that she was going to be the one. I think at some point she's going to make the run at the White Intriguing. House. See? Intriguing. Ryan Grimm and Ryan Grimm's daughter, thank you for your analysis tonight. I appreciate it. You got it. All right. So remember, you only have to be 35 to run for president. So Gene Kuger saw this and he had some things to say. He wanted to talk about this book uh, that Ryan has. It says book reveals AOC and Pelosi's relationship behind the scenes. <laughs> Gene has some things to say because in his words, he said he had, he warned AOC about what she was going to face with Pelosi. Listen to this. Yeah. So there's so many layers to this story. First, um, Whenever progressives win or lose uh, congressional races, I call them afterwards because I want to hear what went wrong, what went right, uh, what can we learn from the race? And then I, I used to ask them, oh, out of curiosity, who else has called you? And then I stopped asking that question because it turns out no one else has called them because no one's ever trying to learn any lessons. It, and I, then I talked to a lot of people in Congress throughout my different years of doing this show, et cetera. And I would ask them, hey, what's your plan for passing this bill or that bill? It's shocking. They Almost no one has any plans. Almost no one is learning any lessons. Like people in politics are stunningly incompetent. And by the way, let me pause here for a second. The reason why I, I can't speak for the other ones who have been there for a long time, but the reason why I think members of the squad don't have any plans is because the moment that they won, they pulled away from the organization that put them in there in the first place. Ralph Nader's talked about this as well. They pulled away from Justice Democrats to the point where these people couldn't even get a hold of them. Not to mention that, but also the podcasters that promoted them, that invited them on their shows. Also, all of a sudden lost all contact with them all of a sudden they didn't want to talk to them anymore so once you leave that apparatus that actually put you in that position in the first place then you're kind of on your own so they had no coaching no tips no nothing none of that stuff but that was their choice they chose to do that so you got to keep in mind in reference to that when Jink talks about this he has to understand they made those decisions they chose to cut off 
the organization that actually could have had their back the entire time, just like they chose to cut off the people who supported them in the first place. That's exactly how AOC and honestly, we beat Joe Crowley, right? So we started just Democrats right here on Young Turks. You guys saw it happen with your own eyes. And and nobody thought we can get anybody elected. And then boom, we knocked out Joe Crowley in one of the biggest political upsets of all time. Now, AOC, obviously the biggest part of that. But I would argue that the second biggest person involved is Shortcut Chokrabarti, the person that you just mentioned there. He was the head of Justice Democrats, then he was the campaign manager for AOC, and then her chief of staff. And then another absolutely pivotal person there was Corbin Trent, who was communications director, again, for all three of those things. Just Democrats, then AOC's campaign, then her congressional office. And what is amazing is after all this time, after one of the greatest upsets in political history, no one's ever asked Troy Cotton Corbin to run another campaign. Well, other than me, okay, <laughs> but like, isn't that unbelievable? And there, but there is a reason why. The reason is they don't want to know because they want to run campaigns that maximizes the amount of money that those consultants make, and you maximize the money by spending as much as humanly possible because they're going to, the campaign managers or consultants usually get 15% of how much you spend in advertising. So they have an incentive to run the world's worst campaigns. The more inefficient the campaign is, the more money they're going to make. Isn't that crazy? So basically, think about this, guys. Basically, what he's saying, I looked into this too. Basically, what he's saying that if you are a campaign manager, you actually financially, you come out better if you're running a campaign that's actually not doing well. In other words, they don't really want to win. So if Shoykot and AOC and, and us, we all come in and we tell them how to run efficient campaigns, like, well, I don't want to hear that. They're like, oh, no, 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 anywhere near the candidate, because then we won't be able to rob the candidate nearly as well as we do now. And and guys, but more importantly than all of that is, these people in DC are fossils. I mean, they came up in politics like 90 years ago. And they're like, you know, politics is local, that's what Tip O'Neill said. But look, guys, that was 280 years ago. All politics was local because uh, people got their news from local newspapers. Local newspapers barely exist anymore. People get their news online and in cable news, etc. It's not lo local at all. All politics is national now. So they're just, they can't adjust at all. They don't want to adjust. So that's the political side of it in terms of campaigns. Now Let me just add something here in reference to politics being uh, local. One thing I want to say is this. Mm -hmm. We've been able to accomplish a lot more on the local level than we have on the national level in reference to progressive policies. I'll say that for sure. Sorry, but that's a reality. When you look at some of these policies, legalizing marijuana, wealth tax, increasing the minimum wage, we've been able to pass those on the local level. Those things have not passed on the national level. Can you believe in 2023, they still have not decriminalized marijuana? Even I'm just gonna say decriminalized. Let's just start with a baby step, not legalize. They won't even decriminalize marijuana on the national level. That's insane when you think about it. That's crazy. So sorry, G, most of the wins have been happening on the local level. Now, when you get to the actual disagreement with Pelosi and AOC, I might have some surprising thoughts there, which is that I actually, I, I don't find any of this to be like, well, first of all, it's not a revelation to me because I, I was I was there. I was there behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's a great book, don't get me wrong. Ryan Grimm's great, uh, his other books on shoptyt.com, we should put that up there, uh, there as well. And Ryan's been a TYT contributor, uh, but- Of course. But more importantly, <laughs> I. Like in the beginning, AOC challenged Nancy Pelosi. And that's what Ryan writes about. And that's when Shoycott and Corbin were there. And that's when we were an insurgency. That's when we were an open rebellion. But after Shoycott and Corbin were shown the door about six months in, 
I haven't seen a rebellion since. Uh, so that's again another example of cutting off the people who were actually there to guide you. So when she protested outside of Nancy Pelosi's office, that was actually on the right. That was the right thing to do. That was the right thing to do. But then you shut yourself off from those people that are heading you in that direction. I don't know what Nancy Pelosi and AOC were disagreeing about because they they barely. I mean, I, I didn't see AOC stand up to Nancy Pelosi on policy almost at all after the beginning. Yep. I think there's a couple factors at play here. The campaign, which I think was great, also benefited from New York Democrats just relying on the machine in that state, not really campaigning. I mean, Crowley was really absent in his district every midterm. They just took it for granted. And you saw that same pattern play out again when Bowman challenged Elliot Engel. You might even remember the hot mic moment where Elliot Engel was heard at a press conference admitting he was only there that year because he had a primary challenger. That's how little they care about people in their district. Yeah, but people have said the same thing about AOC since she's been in Congress. People have made that same complaint about her now. So she did complain about Joe Crowley not being there, showing up in his district. But then people at her, people actually that have contacted AOC's office have made that same complaint. When you talk to people that live in her district, they've said the same thing. Well, she's not really here. So it's just, just repeating the same thing. The same thing that Joe Crowley did. Maybe she's probably more present than he was, but I've heard the same complaints from people from her. Especially when they live in what they see as a safe district or safe seat. So I hope people take that into consideration and more progressives run and challenge uh, incumbent Democrats because you're going to get better responses. You're going to get more attention from your member of Congress who should care about you to begin with. But see, this is the thing. This is what I noticed. This is the thing still with TYT because I haven't watched TYT in it's been years now. They are still stuck. Run through the Democratic Party as a progressive. They're still stuck in that mindset. Like it's like they can't move outside of the Democratic Party. You know, it's like you can continue to complain about the Democratic Party, but if you're still telling people to run in the Democratic Party, I'm just kind of looking at you with my hands in the air. Because it doesn't make any sense. You got to start telling people to do something else. But they're still like, yeah, we need more progressives in the Democratic Party. I'm like, how long are you going to run this game, man? I also want to point out on on the, the two Justice Democrat staffers who haven't been offered roles. It's a really difficult environment to navigate because not only does the DCCC have all this infrastructure and all these vendors, they'll blacklist anybody who works for progressives. So. You, if you want to work and have a long career in in politics, you kind of have to make that calculation. And look, there's a lot of people who are just in it for money. I don't think that's the way you should operate professionally, but sadly there are. And when they see, hey, I can go work for someone whose views align with mine more, or I can go and not be blacklisted and work on some no name uh, moderate who probably won't win, but at least I'll get future jobs. And that's a calculation, sadly, a lot of people need to make because of this blacklist. So to me, all that says, again, it just points back to what I've said over and over again, which is that doing this through the Democratic Party is not getting you anywhere, right? You know, you have all these hurdles that you're up against. Uh, It just does not make any sense, in my opinion. Sorry, but it doesn't.